Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. As Associate Dean of FGV Direito Sao Paulo, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to have you all here to start the first session of the second week of the second of the University of Chicago Fundação Getúlio Vargas Forum in Law and Economics in Brazil. This online second forum, Chicago FGV, fulfills, at least in part, the intention of taking forward the joint initiative of our law schools to organize annual meetings on law and economics in Brazil. We believe this online forum is a good sample of what we expect to do face to face next year in Rio and Sao Paulo. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, Omri ben Shaha from the University of Chicago Law School and Rodrigo Riana from FGV Direito Rio. I'm grateful for all their energy and enthusiasm to organize this venture. Our special thanks to the Chicago and FGV teams that spare no effort to make this event happen in the best possible way. Before we start, I would like to remind you that all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasters exclusively represented their opinions and not necessarily FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presents here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded on this broadcast, which will be posted later at FGV and Chicago's University official channels. This week, we are debating the empirical research in law and economics. This Tuesday, we will have the opportunity to attend a lecture of Professor Damika Dharmapala from the University of Chicago. This Thursday, we'll have a lecture by Professor Bruno Salama, our dear colleague from the FGV Direito São Paulo. Please, we'll have the digital floor, Rodrigo, my colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Lucia. Uh, just to give a few words, just to say hello to everyone. Very nice to have you all here again. Thank you, Omri, for joining us again. It's a privilege and honor to have Professor Damika Damapala with us. Uh, I'm pretty sure the second week will be as good as the first one. I invited our audience to have a quick view in the previous videos in the YouTube channel of FGV. And of course, invite you to the following weeks when we will be discussing very interesting themes and topics related to the law and economics perspective. So with no more delays, I would say and congratulate and say hello to Professor Tamika. Very uh, pleasure to have you here and give word to my fellow colleague, Professor Omri from Chicago University. Always good to have you here, Omri. Thanks again. Thank you, Rodrigo. And thank you, Maria Lucia. Uh, and thank you again for partnering with us on this fantastic uh, enterprise. It is so exciting to see week after week the incredible interest of audiences in Brazil and in surrounding, in, in fact, in many other countries who are logging in to watch this either live or after the session. Um, many of the people that have helped organize this and that are uh, participating have visited Chicago in the past decade and participated in some of our international programs. Many of them are scattered around the world and yet they are always, uh, uh, they, they are joining, loyally joining our, uh, this series and it's very exciting to, uh, to see their names uh, on the list. Um, today's lecture is by my esteemed colleague, Professor uh, Danica Dharmapala, the Paul and Theo Lefman Professor of Law who joined the law school about six years ago, a, a world leader in the area in several areas of economic analysis of law, primarily in the areas of taxation and corporate finance, but his work in other areas, including a tort law um, and the general theory of uh, economic analysis uh, is, uh, is well noted, is remarkably original and creative. Uh, 
Today, Professor Dharmapala will talk about empirical, the empirical approach or empirical analysis of law. Uh, and he is in a particularly good position to do this. Uh, over the last few years, he has been the editor of the most important journal, I would say, in the areas of empirical analysis of law, the famous journal of law and economics that Ronald Coe started uh, 70 years ago or so. It's uh, uh, Professor Dhammapala, it does is in a position to help oversee the production of work by primarily by social scientists, some, some by law professors, but primarily by social scientists that test the effects of laws and their outcomes. For many years in law schools and legal scholars, legal law students did not open their eyes to empirical methods because it's hard to do. We are not social scientists, we are lawyers. But it is no longer impossible to be a serious scholar, student, teacher of law without at least being a consumer of the empirical analysis of law and, and to know what are the effects in the real world that uh, the law provides. To provide an introduction to how to be good consumers of empirical analysis of law, I now invite Professor Dharmapala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omri, and thank you for the invitation to, to present here. Um, I'm going to start by, by sharing my, um, my presentation. And uh, as, as Omri mentioned, I'm, um, uh, I've been co-editor of the Journal of Law and Economics for some time. Uh, I find it very rewarding, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, a famous economist uh, named, named Robert Solo once remarked that uh, being a journal editor, uh, the editor of an academic journal is a particularly thankless task because uh, nine out of 10 authors who submit papers you, you, you end up rejecting and they, they tend to be a little upset with you um, the the uh, one in ten who you accept were, were always convinced that their paper was the the best um, the best contribution ever, and so they're not particularly grateful. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very uh, rewarding uh, rewarding uh, experience, I think, to to see um, all of the, the the research at the frontier. Um, what I will be discussing, um, uh, as as Henri mentioned, is is empirical research in law and economics, and and more particularly how to be an informed consumer of um, the, the various approaches to causal inference that are increasingly used by empirical law and economics scholars. Um, now, uh, law and economics began um, not as an empirical exercise, but as, as, a, um, um, as a, a theoretical and conceptual framework that sought to shed light both on the impact of law on human behavior that is more the, the social science side of, of law and economics, uh, as well as the, the, the content of legal doctrines, uh, which, the, uh, the more legal side of, of law and economics. Uh, both are of course important um, in an interdisciplinary field, but uh, the most powerful applications of empirical analysis have tended to be related to the first of these. And I'll um, focus a little more on that in, in today's lecture, but, but um, one, one, one area in which empirical law and economics uh, can arguably, uh, should, should arguably expand is in, is in thinking more about uh, explaining the content of, of legal doctrines. So uh, there are normative and conceptual debates, um, for example, about the role of efficiency in the law that are ongoing and that, that have by no means been resolved. Um, and the discussion about these continues. Um, and I believe uh, as a, you know, th that Thursday's lecture will, will, uh, will address some of these. Um, and uh, these are not uh, fundamentally empirical questions. However, I think that despite the unsettled nature of some of these normative and conceptual claims, uh, empirical research can still advance the scholarly conversation um, have an, and can have um, both an intellectual and, a, and practical impact. Um, uh, to the extent that we care about consequences, even in the midst of disagreement about how to assess those consequences, empirical evidence is, is relevant, uh, even though those with different normative perspectives may 
place different weight on uh, on um, particular types of evidence. Um, so in that spirit, I'm going to focus very much on, on um, uh, the role of empirical research. Um, uh, as I said before, the initial, um, initial uh, development of law and economics was very much theoretical, but it led to, to uh, two types of empirical questions. One uh, was in terms of testing theories predictions, right? whether we should believe the theories uh, in the light of, of, their, uh, of whether their predictions were, were borne out in, in reality. Um, and the second type of question was uh, what we might think of as how much questions. Uh, so the, the, the um, corporate law might affect um, uh, firm value, but, but how much does it affect it? firm value that is, is, is very important for uh, questions of legal reform and, and policy making. Um, and um, not only are these questions important, it's, uh, it, it is also the case that questions of how much simply cannot be answered in any systematic way without undertaking empirical analysis. Um, so uh, my uh, introduction to law and economics came from uh, the class for classes taught by Bob Cooter at, um, at Berkeley. Um, and um, uh, he once expressed the view that empirical research is the maturation of law and economics into normal science. Uh, here he's alluding to Thomas Kuhn's famous notion of normal science as being guided by a widely accepted paradigm. Um, perhaps this overstates the degree of conceptual agreement in law and economics, but it captures uh, nonetheless the very important notion that there is sufficiently wide agreement to permit significant progress via empirical research. Um, incidentally, he also he made this claim in the University of Illinois Law Review. As Omri mentioned, I joined the University of Chicago about six years ago. Uh, prior to that, I was at the University of Illinois and uh, when I joined uh, Illinois, my colleagues there were, were, were very insistent that uh, the Illinois Law Review was a particularly authoritative publication. Um, so early law and economics scholars um, appeared to be in a fortunate position because they could draw on an extensive set of empirical tools uh, from economics, in particular from a subfield of economics devoted to statistical methods known as econometrics. Um, however, when, when law and economics started in the 19, uh, um, in, in the, um, uh, particularly in the 1980s, econometrics was not held in very high uh, esteem. Uh, uh, prominent economist Edward Lima um, uh, observed that hardly anyone takes data analysis seriously, or more accurately, hardly anyone takes anyone else's data analysis seriously. Uh, around the same time, Sir David Henry of Oxford raised the question of whether empirical economics was more akin to alchemy or science. And this attitude has uh, more recently been transformed within economics uh, by what um, Angrist and Pischke term a, a credibility revolution in empirical research. Uh, this revolution has been mark, marked by increased attention to, uh, to um, empirical design and causal inference, that is to, to experimental and quasi-experimental methods. Perhaps somewhat paradoxically, this revolution has been accompanied by a reduction in the emphasis on sophisticated statistical techniques. Rather, the focus is on thinking carefully about how variation is generated in the real world often through changes in the law, uh, which then creates a, a particularly strong congruence between uh, this revolution in applied economic, um, economic methods and uh, the real world focus of law and economics. Um, so instead of those sophisticated um, statistical techniques, there's an emphasis on the use of vivid graphical representations that make, uh, make empirical results transparent and accessible to a wide non-technical audience. Uh, I've, uh, I've illustrated here in very stylized form um, the, the, kinds of, uh, the kinds of graphs that, that people, people use in this, in this um, scholarly literature. 
Um, but the, the use of, of um, the simple graphical representations has made, uh, made empirical research much more accessible broadly and has enabled uh, a wider range of people to be uh, informed and critical consumers of, of, of this research. Um, in this tradition, the analogy to randomized trials in medicine with the use of treatment and control groups has been particularly pro prominent and powerful. So I will provide a survey of these developments as they have been reflected in law and economic scholarship, um, illustrating them with, with some examples. Uh, a number of these examples are drawn from my own work um, and they're chosen not necessarily because of their, their quality or value, but simply because I, I happen to be particularly familiar with them. Uh, so uh, let's take a step back and, and um, consider the fundamental problem of causal inference. Uh, suppose that we observe uh, some treatment uh, and observe some outcome. Uh, in order to determine with certainty whether, whether the, the treatment caused the outcome, we need to observe the counterfactual, that is a world in which everything else was completely identical except for the treatment. Uh, then we know that if, if Y, um, if we can conclude that if Y happened in that counterfactual world, um, X did, uh, was not the cause or the treatment was not the cause. Um, and if Y does not happen counterfactually, then the treatment uh, did have a causal impact. Um, but of course, we, we don't observe uh, this, this counterfactual world and we can think of these techniques of causal inference as all trying to construct a counterfactual, uh, the, the most credible counterfactual that we can find in the, in, uh, the particular circumstances that we're faced with. Perhaps the most common approach to, to causal inference, um, and in, in some ways the most, most intuitive, is the, um, is the difference, difference approach, uh, where we, um, uh, we wish to determine whether some treatment X causes an, uh, some outcome Y, we have two groups, uh, in the simplest setting, we have two groups and two time periods in a data set. Uh, in the first period, neither group has been treated. And uh, in the second period, one group, but not the other, receives the treatment. Uh, so here, here's, uh, here's a representation uh, of that scenario. Um, so, um, here we, we um, uh, let, me, let me provide an example from, um, from some recent work I've done um, uh, here with, with um, uh, John Rappaport and Richard McAdams, who are colleagues at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, in the United States, um, and I think not, not only in the United States, but it is perhaps especially so in the United States, there has been growing interest in the causes of police misconduct. And in this uh, public and scholarly conversation, the role of, um, of labor unions and of collective bargaining rights have become uh, an important element. Uh, however, there are a number of different ways in which unionization or collective bargaining rights may affect uh, police misconduct. Uh, one possibility is that uh, procedural protections that are embedded in collective bargaining agreements um, may uh, may uh, reduce the deterrence of misconduct. And so that, that we can think of as a classic law and economics theoretical view uh, that uh, the amount of misconduct depends on uh, the expected sanction, uh, going back to uh, Becker's famous contribution in 1968. Uh, alternatively, uh, it's possible that if unionization leads to higher wages, uh, more training or a sense of empowerment, it may reduce misconduct. And this uh, argument is somewhat along the lines of uh, that of uh, also of Gary Becker, actually, of, of Becker and Stigler uh, in 1974, where they, they argued that higher compensation increases the opportunity cost of misconduct. If, uh, if you're paid a higher wage, uh, you lose more if, you're, if you um, uh, commit misconduct and are detected. Um, and so um, this is uh, that there are potentially conflicting theoretical intuitions or predictions 
even within the law and economics tradition. Um, and this provides us with a, a, a good illustration of why uh, we need empirical research. This is, this is fundamentally an empirical question because, uh, because it's not something we can uh, resolve with, our, with theory or, or intuition. Um, in, and incidentally, while, while I've, I've described, um, described primarily economic theories uh, that, are, that, that are conflicting, uh, conflicting predictions, uh, there is no reason in, in, in why, why empirical tests cannot also encompass non-economic theories. Um, so with that background in mind, let's consider how we might analyze this question empirically. Um, suppose that the number of incidents of misconduct um, scaled in some appropriate way um, is six at, at um, unionized police departments and nine at, at um, non-unionized um, police departments, which we'll um, rather uh, loosely refer to as the treatment and control group. Of course, unionization itself is not, um, is not randomly assigned um, to, um, to police departments. Uh, so the, the problem here is that we cannot simply look at the second period and compare outcomes across the two groups uh, because the two groups may have unobservable differences that affect the outcome. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, we cannot um, simply look at the, at the group of unionized uh, police departments and compare the first period and second period uh, because um, the, um, there may be trends over time that would cause outcomes to change even in the absence of the treatment. Right? So these are the fundamental problems uh, that we face uh, doing either a before or after study or of comparing um, uh, across groups at a given point in time. Uh, the difference in, uh, in, uh, the, in, in difference approach accounts both for unobservable differences across the groups and for uh, trends over time uh, across the, the two groups. Um, and it does so by um, computing the difference between the two groups, both before and after the treatment. Uh, so in this instance, in, in, in my simple example, the difference be, uh, beforehand, before the, 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 uh, one of the groups is treated is five, uh, the difference after the, the, the one of the groups is treated is three, um, and we have taken account of both trends that might affect both groups and of unobservable differences across the groups, um, and we end up with a difference in difference of two. Um, now, of course, um, uh, in order to, to estimate this with a real data set, uh, we need to find credible treatment and control groups, and we need uh, a natural experiment or, or quasi-experiment. Um, and often that's, that's easier said than done. Um, there is a um, very old joke about, about economists um, uh, called, called the can opener joke about an economist, a physicist, and a chemist who are marooned on an island with a, uh, with a can of, uh, of food, but no, uh, no implement with which to open it. And um, the, the physicist tries to come up with, uh, uh, with a way to, to open it by, by, by throwing it at exactly the right speed against, against a rock. Uh, the chemist tries to come up with a, with a chemical reaction um, that will open the can. And, and, the, and the economist thinks for a little while and then says, let's assume we have a can opener. Uh, right, so so uh, this is, it's it's often easier said than done to find a natural experiment, but um, but it, sometimes it is possible. And in this particular instance, what we use in this in the paper that I've um, that I'm, I'm drawing from um, with uh, uh, Richard McAdams and John Rappaport is um, a change in the law in uh, in Florida. We first obtain uh, data on incidents of police misconduct. And we focus in particular on, on incidents of violent misconduct um, from uh, a Florida state agency. 
uh, and then uh, use as a quasi-experiment uh, this case um, known, as, known as Williams that, happened in, in, that was decided in 2003. Uh, prior to, to 2003, uh, officers in, in police departments had collective bargaining rights, but in a, in a different type of uh, law enforcement agency, sheriff's offices, which, which operate at the county level, uh, officers did not have collective bargaining rights. Then in 2003, the Florida Supreme Court extended collective bargaining rights to sheriff's officers. So we think of here of, of sheriff's officers being treated and police departments uh, serving as a control group because although they, they do have collective bargaining rights, they, they, that did not change at, in uh, 2003 and was, was unaffected by the, the Williams decision. So uh, uh, a, um, uh, a, a primary uh, concern, of course, is whether um, these two different types of law enforcement agencies are sufficiently comparable. Um, and, and the typical way to, to assess that is to, is to uh, test for parallel uh, pre-existing pre trends or pre-trends. Um, so we test whether trends in violent incidents of police misconduct would have been similar for sheriff's officers and police departments, but for this Williams case. Um, one way to test that is to uh, plot these, the, these numbers over time. Um, uh, and we see beforehand, before 2003, um, fairly, uh, fairly similar looking pre-trends. Um, and then we see a jump uh, in, the, in the blue line uh, here for the, is the treatment group and the dashed red line is the control group. And we see, the, see an increase for the, uh, for the treatment group. Um, a, a different way to, um, way to uh, test, test for this is to estimate differences between uh, sheriff's offices and police departments, um, both before and after, the, uh, after 2003. Um, that is, if, if these differences existed or, uh, for, for other reasons, we would pick them up both before and after uh, the Williams decision. Uh, as it turns out, there's, um, there are no systematic uh, prior trends. So these, these, um, do, these circles represent the, the estimated difference between uh, sheriff's office, between the number of violent incidents at sheriff's offices and police departments. The vertical lines represent confidence intervals. Um, beforehand, they, they cross zero, which means we, we, don't, uh, we cannot reject the uh, possibility that they, they were identical. Um, afterwards, um, after 2003, uh, although the, the estimates are, are for most years are fairly noisy, they tend to be larger and um, statistically significant for some years. Um, so this is um, uh, the way that, that uh, this is, these are two different ways that one might test for this crucial assumption of parallel pretrends. Um, importantly, um, what, we're, what we're fundamentally interested in is, is actually not uh, parallel pretrends, but rather um, parallel, uh, parallel counterfactual trends. So let me try to explain the distinction between the two. Um, suppose that we have some outcome Y and we have a treatment at this particular point in time represented by the vertical um, dashed line here. Uh, we have outcomes for the control group in red, outcomes for the treatment group in green, and we see we estimate this treatment effect um, what we what we generally are able to test for is parallel pretrends. Um, uh, in an ideal world, we'd like to know, of course, whether the counterfactual trends would have been identical. Right, that's given here by the dashed green line, but this is uh, this is generally un unobservable. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these these parallel trends are um, are a key element of a, a different different strategy. Um, as, are, um, as is the quasi-randomness of the treatment. So one might ask, how do we, how do we find random treatments? We need a quasi-random uh, treatment that, that creates, um, these, these, this tr creates a treatment group and a control group. Um, often changes in the law will generate um, treatment and control groups, but we have to be very careful to, to ensure that the, this, the assignment to those groups is, is quasi-random, um, not just not any just any change in the law 
do, for example, change in the law that applies to everyone, or if, if for example, all firm, um, isn't, isn't very helpful um, in a difference in difference framework. Um, secondly, uh, it is possible to conduct randomized control trials. Um, these require significant res resources, however, and they can only address certain types of questions. Um, for example, in the tax compliance uh, literature, there's, there's a, a lot of studies that partner with a, a government tax authority and send letters to taxpayers um, uh, that, uh, threatening them with, with audits and then, and then you, uh, they observe how taxpayer compliance changes. Um, the, the, so, so certain questions can be well addressed in this way, but, but certain other questions um, cannot. Sometimes governments themselves randomize their policies, and I'll give you an example in just, just a minute. Um, or there may be arbitrary regulatory thresholds that can be used um, in difference in difference or the other uh, causal inference methods. Um, so the, um, uh, the government randomization, um, uh, I've drawn an example from um, this paper by Ferraz and Finan, uh, where they, they, they draw on a policy of the Brazilian federal government of randomly auditing um, municipal governments to, to, um, uh, to, to find corruption that began in 2003. Um, the, the municipalities that were, that were audited were randomly chosen. Um, and they were chosen by lottery in a uh, transparent and, and, and observable process. Um, so the authors argue that this was this was a good example of uh, of random treatment. What they do is to uh, look at uh, uh, look at um, municipalities that were audited um, before and after the, the October two thousand four municipal elections, um, and the the uh, premise is that whether uh, whether a, a, a local um, government was was audited before or after the elections is, is random since the, the choice of uh, municipalities is random. And they compare re-election rates for mayors who were audited uh, before the election, the treatment group, where the, the, the voters knew of the revealed uh, amount of corruption, uh, if any, um, uh, with a control group of mayors who were audited after the election. Um, so this is a graph from their, from their paper uh, the vertical axis shows the re-election rate and the horizontal axis, the number of uh, violations that were found on audit. So what they, what, what we can do is look at um, different municipalities with the same level of corruption as revealed by audits and compare the re-election rate for treated mayors who were audited before the election. Uh, and it turns out that they were, they were substantially less likely to be re-elected than the control mayors who were audited after the election. Um, and the authors draw various conclusions uh, from this about the role of electoral accountability in uh, reducing, uh, reducing corruption. Um, to illustrate arbitrary thresholds, I um, want to move to, to one of my papers. Um, in 2002, uh, Congress enacted the, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, which imposed extensive new obligations on uh, publicly listed firms. Um, uh, and this led to, to concern among some scholars and policymakers that regulation had become too burdensome. Um, and that um, concern led to the enactment of what is called the, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups or Jobs Act in 2012. Um, this, uh, the acronym JOBS here follows a venerable congressional tradition uh, in which titles of bills are the, are the acronyms of, of bills broadcast politically popular concepts such as jobs here in the, in the sense of, of employment, uh, regardless of the actual content of the legislation. Uh, for those of, who are, who are, uh, of you who are familiar with the television comedy series, Yes, Prime Minister, um, Sir Humphrey Appleby makes a, a very similar remark about the titles of government reports. Um, so the, the JOBS Act created a new category of public corporations known as emerging growth companies uh, that were subject to reduced disclosure and compliance obligations. The, um, 
criteria for qualifying as an as an EGC or emerging, emerging growth company was uh, were, were, ge were generating less than a billion dollars of revenue and um, conducting your IPO or, or your initial issuance of securities after December 8th of 2011, a date that was chosen uh, retroactively by Congress uh, in March of 2012. So uh, a firm going public um, on December 9th, 2011 would not have had any idea that it would um, um, it would be subject to this this uh, changed changed set of uh, securities regulations. Um, so in the in this paper, we we construct treatment and control groups based on that arbitrary uh, temporal threshold. We can uh, we can look at both revenue and the date of the of the initial public offering or IPO. Um, we, we find very few firms that were that were above the the revenue threshold. So. So our treatment group ends up consisting of, of firms that went public after December 8th, and the um, uh, control group is primarily firms that went public um, in the few months before December 8th. So this, uh, this is an example of how uh, one might use these arbitrary thresholds to create um, treatment and control groups. Unfortunately, in this instance, the number of firms is, is relatively small, uh, but there is no reason to think that uh, that firms that went public before and after December 8, 2011, um, were systematically different in, in any relevant way. Thirty minutes. Thank you. Um, so here's um, uh, so let's return to our general difference in difference framework, um, and consider what happens if the control group happens to look very different than than the treatment group. Um, there are uh, statistical tests for balance with respect to, to the, the variables you can observe, um, but if, if the groups um, end up being unbalanced, then what, do we, what, what should we do? Uh, because it's, it's difficult to claim that counterfactual trends would have been similar, but for the treatment. Uh, so there are several different ways in which uh, one might address this problem. Um, uh, one uses um, uses matching methods to augment the difference in difference approach. Uh, one uh, one type of matching approach is the is propensity score matching, which involves computing what's called a propensity score, that is the, the probability of treatment uh, predicted using observed characteristics uh, of each of each unit, each individual or each firm or, or whatever the unit might happen to be. Um, and another is, is called Coulson's exact matching or CEM. Uh, PSM involves um, the following, doing the following. So let's suppose the, that the, the green um, rectangles are treatment units um, and the red circles are, are control units. What we do is to compute a probability of treatment for each unit, whether it was actually treated or not. Uh, so it might be that uh, this particular unit has a 0.93 probability of treatment, um, while this one has 0.15 probability of treatment. And so we would be rather wary of comparing these two units, which seem very different um, along their, their observable characteristics. Um, so the, the a PSM method would, would then uh, construct what's called a common support that is the set of treatment and control groups that um, have quite similar probabilities of treatment uh, and then compare treatment and control units within that com common support. Um, Coulson's exact matching um, involves, um, uh, a, uh, it involves uh, create, uh, coulsoning the um, units of, 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 the, uh, of X, which is here on, on our horizontal axis. So instead of measuring X very precisely, we coarsen the, 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 um, the bands um, and then compare units within the same band. Um, so this band over here, the frequency my, my, my cursor, um, contains both treatment and control units. This band over here only contains control units. Um, so, we, so we would want to use this band, but not uh, not this one. Um, and um, then we, we then we end up comparing 
uh, units that are, that, are, that are more comparable to them. Uh, so this procedure yields a high degree of balance, uh, obviously by, by construction. Um, <clears throat> matching methods, incidentally, can also be used uh, independent, independently of a, of a difference in difference approach. Uh, we might simply match, um, so in, in a situation where we don't have quasi-random assignment, we might simply match um, uh, units with, with, uh, with, with a, a highly, with a, with a non-random treatment uh, with uh, other units that, that don't have that treatment and compare the two. But the problem is that matching can only address issues that relate to, to observable variables. And um, it's difficult to observe, uh, sorry, it's difficult to establish that uh, differences in outcomes are not due to unobservable characteristics uh, if we do not have some quasi-random treatment. Um, so, so matching itself, um, absent uh, quasi-random treatment uh, is arguably therefore not, uh, not really a, um, a, a causal inference method. Uh, another um, situation in which uh, difference and difference approaches are often used, uh, uh, especially in, um, within, within uh, law and economics and, and within other fields like, like uh, corporate finance, is what's called a staggered difference in difference approach, where different units are treated at different times. For example, um, in the United States in the 1980s, different states enacted uh, anti-takeover laws, uh, thereby treating the, those firms that were incorporated in, in uh, the state that was, that was enacting the, the, the law at different times. Um, and uh, going back to the example that I used earlier about uh, law enforcement agencies unionization, we might observe different law enforcement agencies unionizing at different times. Um, and estimate, uh, estimating the impact of this kind of staggered treatment across different states or different firms or different um, law enforcement agencies um, is a common empirical, uh, empirical approach that is widely used in, in law and economics. Um, but um, there are some pitfalls with this, uh, and recent methodological research uh, suggests that it may lead to, to uh, somewhat misleading inferences. Um, the primary problems are that when, uh, when there are many treated units uh, treated at different times, it is difficult to test for, uh, for parallel pretrends in a, in a transparent way. Uh, it is also possible that uh, different units may respond differently to the same treatment. Um, and then the estimate ends up being some combination of these, these different effects. Um, and um, uh, so we, we don't, um, uh, so, so we, we don't really know what the, what the average, uh, or we, we don't, have a good sense of what the average effect is. The, the, uh, in, in this type of design, the um, already treated units, for example, the states that have already passed anti-takeover legislation uh, form part of the control group for, um, for firms and states that, that, that experience the treatment later. Um, and that can be problematic if there are, particularly if there are dynamic effects of the treatment, uh, effects that, ch that change over time. Um, so just to illustrate some of these problems, I uh, constructed a, a sim very simple hypothetical data set with uh, three firms, two of which are treated. Um, and this is in quote, quotation marks because uh, we might, might or might not think this is, a, this is truly random treatment. Um, for example, different, the two of the firms might appoint independent directors to their board um, at different times. And um, uh, then we think of the treatment as a as, as, um, greater degree of board independence, but, um, uh, but, but firm one is, is never treated. Um, firm two is treated at time two and firm three at time three as illustrated here. Um, and by construction here, so we are interested in firm value as the, as the outcome. Um, and, um, uh, by construction, uh, these treatments have no impact. We simply uh, have 
uh, the fir have firm value following the, the same trend that it that it was previously following. Um, so that so treatment the treatment effect here is zero by construction, but uh, a naive uh, application of staggered difference in difference would yield a positive effect. Now, in this particular example, um, uh, one might correct for that by uh, by accounting for um, for time trends for, for, for each firm, but the more general problems that I highlighted remain. So as a result of these uh, these issues, current research in um, empirical uh, economics and in, and in law and economics has moved towards what's called a, a panel event study approach, uh, where uh, one defines uh, what are called event time indicators. So year minus two is two years before the treatment um, and plus three is three years after the treatment. But of course, because the treatment is staggered, uh, it occurs at different times for different units, um, plus three might occur in 2015 for one unit and uh, 2012 for, for a different unit. Um, then we, we estimate or plot the outcomes for each of the event time indicators. Um, and the, uh, the advantages of this approach over staggered difference in difference um, um, are that Firstly, the existence of parallel trends or the, or the absence of parallel trends is highly transparent. We can observe very uh, straightforwardly whether the uh, putative treatment occurred before or after the date uh, on which, um, uh, on which uh, I'm sorry, the putative effect occurred before or after the, uh, the, the treatment that we're interested in. Um, and um, the central assumption here is the following. So, so bear in mind that, um, these, that the treatment itself or which units end up being treated, right? For example, which law enforcement agencies unionize uh, may be endogenous, which states enact anti-takeover laws may be, uh, may be uh, non-random. Uh, however, as long as the precise timing of the treatment is quasi-random, uh, we can still draw some. Uh, we can uh, still draw some causal inferences from a panel event study approach. Um, and let me just illustrate that with uh, some ongoing work. Um, and I, I should caution some very preliminary work with Emma Kaufman and, and John Rappaport um, using um, an extension of the, the same Florida data that I mentioned earlier. Um, we look at um, uh, the racial composition of. of um, of hires after unionization, um, and we see no systematic pretrends before unionization. Um, afterwards, we see uh, we see this decline in the number of African American hires. Um, so, because it happens after, but not before the treatment, um, we can have some confidence that that it um, uh, that it is a causal impact of um, of the treatment. So, so next, I want to move to um, uh, a, a different uh, type of, of approach used for, for causal inference, the, the regression discontinuity design. And while it's now widely used in, in law and economics, um, it has its origins in education. Um, and so let me start with an example um, related to that field. Suppose that university en entrance is determined by a strict um, exam school cutoff or threshold of 75 points. Um, and we, what we want to do is measure the causal impact of admission to this university on um, the, the earnings of graduates. Uh, so we, w the, the key insight here is that uh, someone who scores 76 on this exam and someone who scores 74 um, are essentially identical. That is, uh, the difference in their scores is, is, is essentially random. And so we can assign some to, the, to a treatment group, those who, are, those who scored just above 75 and were admitted, and those who scored just under 75 and were rejected. And this uh, allows us to estimate the causal effect of admission. Um, importantly, this is the causal effect of admission for students who are 
um, around the, the threshold, not necessarily for all students. So let me illustrate um, this um, design. So suppose that we, on the vertical axis, we, we, we measure wages as a, as a graduate, and on the horizontal axis, we, we measure the exam score. I've shown the, the, the cutoff at 75 here um, with the dashed black line. Um, we, what we do is look at the, uh, the discontinuous jump right at, um, at the threshold. And uh, under certain assumptions, we can, we can infer that, uh, that that is the causal effect of admission on wages for, for applicants with, with scores close to the threshold. And then we illustrate with a, uh, a well-known example from law and economics, a paper by Black, Jang, and Kim on corporate governance reforms in Korea. Um, these reforms imposed uh, additional requirements on larger firms that had uh, two trillion won or more in, in assets. And so that was a that was a, a threshold. Um, Black, Jang, and Kim constructed a corporate governance index for Korean firms. Uh, based on a stock exchange survey uh, covering the, the following types of attributes. And they uh, plot, so here they've, they've plotted the corporate governance index against the log of asset size. So the, the two trillion one threshold is shown by this vertical line. Um, and we see um, that the index jumps at the threshold. And the reason for that is that um, the, the, the law uh, seems to have an effect on governance practices in the sense that the, the, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a flow on, uh, govern on the level of governance for, for larger firms, and that seems to be binding. Um, but this is a different question from the question of whether, the, uh, whether corporate governance has an impact on firm value. And to test that, uh, they look at, sorry, they look at, um, uh, they look at uh, firm value on the, on, this, on the vertical axis, uh, with this, with asset size on the horizontal axis, what we see here is that uh, there is a discontinuous jump in firm value at the threshold. Um, and um, Black, uh, Jang, and Kim use this discontinuous jump to argue that higher values of the index, that is, say, um, stronger corporate governance, causes uh, higher firm value. Um, there's no reason for, to to expect firm value to jump at this threshold. Um, uh, other than uh, through an impact of, of corporate governance on firm value, uh, the underlying economic factors that determine firm value would presumably have a smooth impact so, uh, as, as asset size changes, but the regulation is discontinuous. Right. So uh, importantly, uh, the estimated effects uh, from uh, RD designs are local in the sense that they apply only around the threshold. Um, however, one significant advantage of uh, regression discontinuity designs is that it is possible to test the central identifying assumption, right? which is that subjects cannot control which side of the threshold they fall on uh, through a manipulation test. Um, there are, and there are very, various extensions of the, of the RD design that I, I won't go into here, but, but uh, let me illustrate the manipulation test. Um, uh, or actually this discussion that, that we, we don't need a completely strict cutoff. Um, a fuzzy regression discontinuity design uh, can still work as long as there's a sufficiently high increase in the probability. Um, and then increasingly uh, scholars are using spatial um, regression discontinuity designs, for example, using national borders where um, laws change discontinuously um, to, to represent discontinuities across space and, and test for various outcomes around national borders. Returning to the manipulation test, um, uh, we have um, uh, here, uh, here are the, the exam score as before on the horizontal axis uh, with our threshold at 75, uh, but now we are testing um, instead of um, Instead of uh, plotting the, the wages of graduates, we're plotting the number of students who have a particular exam score. We're plotting the density of students, if you like, uh, um, here. And um, if that looks smooth around the threshold, then uh, that uh, gives us some reason to think that uh, subjects cannot 
uh, manipulate the threshold or cannot manipulate which side of the threshold they fall on. On the other hand, if the uh, distribution of students uh, across exam scores looks like this, right? If there's a jump on the right side of the threshold, um, then we might suspect that uh, the students are endogenously responding to the threshold. For example, they may be more likely to complain about their exam score and seek uh, regrading of their exam if they're just below 75 uh, than, uh, in, in terms of their score. Um, so this type of scenario um, seems to um, would, would undermine the regression discontinuity approach uh, because we can no longer uh, assume that uh, the assignment of, of uh, subjects to, to, to treatment and control groups is quasi-random. However, there's a, there's a, a different uh, method of causal inference that um, that takes uh, that that, that uh, takes advantage of of, of, of um, this manipulate this type of manipulation um, in in a somewhat different way, and that's called the bunching design. Um, so bunching design we can think of as being somewhat complementary to a regression discontinuity design because um, um, because um, it, it applies in scenarios where regression discontinuity design is not uh, cannot credibly be applied. Uh, and we can use a budging design uh, in some circumstances to draw inferences about the impacts of, for example, of regulations that have uh, that have fixed the thresholds. Um, in particular, under certain assumptions, the costs that individuals or firms are willing to incur in order to stay uh, above or below some threshold can reveal the costs of compliance with the underlying regulation. Uh, so let's return to our, to our example of the uh, to, to our prior example of uh, the securities regulation in the United States. Uh, in 2002, as previously mentioned, Congress enacted the Sarbanes Oxley Act that uh, imposed extensive new obligations on firms. And many of these provisions applied at a threshold of $75 million or more of public float. Public float is the uh, value of the firm, the market value of the firm that is not owned by insiders and, and uh, block holders. Um, and um, so uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sharp threshold um, at $75 million um, and so what we can do with that threshold is, is something along the following lines. Um, suppose that uh, we plot the number of firms on the, on the vertical axis and they, the public float that firms report on the horizontal axis, um, that's, that's the $75 million threshold. Um, and what we do is we start with um, some excluded interval around $75 million. And then look at public float um, away from this from the threshold right so we see over here we now we see a larger number of smaller firms um, in, in this particular representation that's the observed density of firms uh, with respect to their public float and then we estimate a counterfactual um, this density of firms in this excluded interval uh, using some using a, a usually a higher order polynomial so this dashed black line represents that counterfactual uh, the density of firms, um, and then we look at the actual density of firms uh, just below and just above the um, excluded interval. Um, suppose that it looks like this, right? Suppose that there's a larger number of firms than we, we would expect just below the threshold and a smaller number of firms just above the threshold. Um, so that, that is, uh, so the the, the former is called the, the excess mass uh, of, of firms below the uh, below the threshold, and there's a there's a missing mass of firms uh, above the threshold. And under certain assumptions, the magnitude of this excess mass provides uh, an estimate of the costs of compliance with the regulation. Uh, and this is drawn uh, from a working paper of mine um, that um, plots, um, that, the, that, that estimates um, uh, graphs of this type for, for, US, uh, for the public float of, of US firms. 
Um, what we see here is that in the period immediately after uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation was enacted, um, there appears to be a missing mass um, just above the, the, the threshold. But in later years, uh, there's, there's uh, no evidence of a missing mass. There's a relatively smooth distribution of public float just uh, above and below the, the, the threshold, uh, which possibly indicates that compliance costs declined over time, um, as uh, perhaps as firms learn learn more about the, the about compliance with the with the regulations. Um, so um, uh, the bunching approach then um, essentially uh, enables us to 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 draw these in inferences about um, about the costs of regulation from the arbitrariness of the thresholds. That, uh, that, are, that are imposed. Um, so let me um, uh, move then to, to just a, a brief summary. Um, what, we've, uh, what we've been reviewing are uh, the methods of, of causal inference uh, that, are, that are widely used in, in law and economics. Um, and I hope, uh, the, here presented in, in an, uh, a non-technical uh, manner that, that uh, I hope is, is broadly accessible. Um, so, so one of the important themes here is the, is, um, uh, the relevance of control groups. Uh, we, we need not just changes in the law, but we need uh, changes in the law that, can, that create, uh, whether by, by design or by, by accident, um, both treatment and, and control groups. Um, and um, this uh, type of empirical research in, in law and economics, uh, we can view uh, both as relating to uh, empirical research in, uh, in applied fields of economics. That's, that's one, uh, one aspect or, or angle on, on this type of research. Um, and we can uh, think about uh, how, I and mean, we can recall, you know, recalling how Variation is often based on changes in the law. Uh, we can argue that, that law and economics can thus play a central role uh, within this wider uh, research agenda within, um, within applied economics. Um, but we can also uh, view this type of research from the perspective of law as bringing, uh, bringing uh, new empirical tools and particularly methods of causal inference to bear on questions of, of importance to, to legal scholars. Um, and while um, economists outside of law and economics often use changes in the law as a source of exogenous variation, uh, typically their interest is primarily on the outcomes and not in the, uh, in the law itself. Whereas law and economics scholars uh, carry out uh, what might look like fairly similar um, research with, with similar empirical designs, but are in a position to, to place greater emphasis on the law and what can be learned from the perspective of questions that are important to uh, legal scholars and uh, professors at, at, at law schools. Um, 55 minutes. Thank you um, very much. So um, this, um, that's perfect actually, because I'm, I'm just, uh, just concluding here. Uh, so, so I think that makes uh, makes the argument. I think both for why uh, law and empirical research in law and economics is, is important for uh, the wider social science community, um, and why it's important for the wider um, legal community. Um, and uh, as I said before, even though there are ongoing conceptual and normative debates in law and economics, we can um, still advance discussion on many topics through the use of empirical evidence um, and uh, empirical evidence also, um, uh, also is, is highly congruent with the, the practical orientation of the law. Um, so just, just to briefly uh, conclude by reviewing the various methods of causal inference that I've discussed, uh, we started with uh, the difference in difference approach, uh, which can sometimes be augmented with matching techniques um, uh, we discussed the relative merits of uh, staggered difference and difference designs versus panel uh, event study approaches. And um, we also discussed regression discontinuity um, 
and um, uh, bunching approaches. We did not have time to cover um, uh, another, but, but quite different set of um, research designs in empirical law and economics uh, that, that use field and, and lab experiments. Uh, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions that, that uh, any, anyone in the audience has. And uh, thank you for your attention. Well, uh, many thanks, Professor Demica. Uh, well, I just I have a, a, a broader comment that I would like to, to hear some thoughts of you. Uh, as well said uh, Omri in the beginning of the, the, this lecture, uh, both law and economics and empirical research not necessarily are uh, themes and topics that are addressed commonly in traditional law schools and we have a lot of law schools in brazil and fortunately both law schools of fgv in rio and in sao paulo and the chicago law school uh, we teach law and economics as a mandatory uh, subject in our undergraduate and graduate courses as well we use law and economics as an important tool in our research centers. Uh, in fact, we, we used to say here that we, we practice what we call impact research, since we use real data, real facts uh, to promote analysis uh, that we intend to change the situation, to change to modern the institutions and to create new legislations. And, and this, this is the main goal of our research centers at FGV and of course in Chicago because we, we already know it. Um, so uh, I would say we are pretty accustomed of, of having together with the lawyers and the law professors, we have economics, uh, we have uh, uh, economists, we have um, uh, anthropologists, sociologists, mathematicians, computing engineers, we have everyone all together. Uh, and, and the result is, is, is really interesting because uh, at first it seems something incompatible. Uh, mathematicians with lawyers working together, but in the end the results are, are really great. And we are starting to promote very interesting analysis regarding judicial decisions about the impact of some kind of legislations on anti-corruption on a specific criminal law uh, bill that has recently passed or uh, regarding elections and consumer law or the impacts of arbitration so we have several fields and we have several examples of many things that we can use law and economics to produce better lawyers better judges better legislators better regulators and better academics as well so i would ask you what do you think are the main challenges uh, to the law schools to implement uh, a, a movement of using empirical research in law and law and economics as well we want to stimulate this 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 is the main goal of this forum for example so i would hear something about you know, your thoughts on that because you are really experienced on that given your your extent curriculum many thanks many thanks for the lecture thank you very much yes yeah, so the main challenge i think um from the perspective of law school is just the limited um time and limited um uh, space in the curriculum for example um, i think um the the law so law schools have um the primary task of, of teaching legal doctrine. And um, we can think of law and economics as, as uh, sometimes um, helping with that, with that task, but, but uh, more often it is, about, it is more about um, the um, study of governance and more, more generally, right? It is um, not about legal doctrine, but about the impact of law in, in society. And um, uh, the I, I think the I think those two things should um, should go hand in hand in, in, in many ways. 
Um, but there are obvious uh, trade-offs in terms of time um, and uh, space and the curriculum. And, and I think that, that does provide um, a challenge, but I think um, we can we can overcome or many, many you know many law schools in the, in the US and elsewhere have overcome those challenges by um, trying to, to, to integrate the study of governance um, uh, of, of law as, as a form of governance in uh, more, more directly into the curriculum. Um, and there is also a question as to um, how much of law and economics should we expect law schools to, to, to host or, or carry out um, and how much we should expect um, departments of economics or business schools or uh, schools of public policy to, to, to carry out. And I think there's, um, uh, you know, certainly both, uh, both those types of institutions, or all of those types of institutions have, have a role, but um, uh, if law schools were to leave interdisciplinary research mostly to, to uh, departments outside of law, um, I think something important is lost because the, the legal perspective isn't, um, uh, isn't uh, represented in, in, um, uh, in, that, in that type of research. And I think um, in many of these situations where changes in the law create uh, random treatment, right? And to use the language that I've been using in the, in the, in the talk, um, that uh, understanding that requires a, a, a detailed knowledge, of, both a detailed knowledge of the law and um, a, a detailed knowledge of empirical techniques. Um, and that can be achieved sometimes through collaboration, but uh, by, by different co-authors, but uh, it is also helpful to, to, to have a body of people who are, who are um, uh, focused on both things. Um, so I, I do understand the challenges that you alluded to, um, but I do think the, uh, there, there, is, there is a lot of, there's a, a high payoff to, to overcoming those challenges to the extent we can. Um, Thank and, you, Thank. Yep, yeah, please. I, I do think sure. the impact, this concept of impact research is very, uh, is very significant because um, I, I do think that um, empirical, that at least um, from, so this is sort of stepping away a little bit from the perspective of, of uh, the generalist law school and, and thinking of law and economic scholars. I think law and economic scholars have had um, uh, more impact um, through empirical research in many ways than through theoretical research. Uh, important as theoretical research is, uh, because uh, particularly when empirical results are uh, can can be can be conveyed through in a very vivid way um, uh, to to a general audience, uh, I think that, that you can reach a, a much um, a, a much broader um, spectrum of, of lawyers, law students, and and other and policymakers than uh, purely theoretical research. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Well, we have a question here from the, the YouTube chat uh, from Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, thank you for the such an interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering to know whether randomizing with control trials could play a role or fix the errors in risk assessment score employed by the judiciary. Um. So in general, I think randomized control trials are, um, are a valuable tool. Um, in, in those circumstances where um, we, can, um, we can actually undertake them, right? There are some questions for which they're not so well suited. But in the, this particular instance, the question is about judicial, um, if I'm understood correctly, about judicial risk scores um, in the context of uh, if I can just clarify, um, this is about um, using randomized control trials in the context of the risk scores pertaining to what exactly? Well, uh, could play a role of fixed error in risk assessment score employed by judiciary. Uh, I oh, don't I know see. I'm sorry. Is this for... Um, Risk of um, reoffending, for example. 
Okay, so I think um, uh, there may be um, significant ethical concerns with, with um, using randomized control trials in certain contexts. Um, but from a purely um, statistical and empirical point of view, um, I think they, they do represent in many ways the gold standard for, um, for this type of research. So where it, where, where it is feasible and where it really does address the question of interest uh, as, as, as is perhaps with the, the risk assessment score, um, I, I, think the, I think the answer would be yes, but uh, bearing in mind that there are both practical and, and ethical constraints on, um, on randomized control trials that uh, we should, of which we should be mindful. Yeah, yeah, I think that takes uh, takes important important part of part of it. Um, let me see. Um, I have a question here from Haisa. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor. Uh, law professionals, for the most part, are not used to interdisciplinarity with other science. How can legal professional be improved to use data from empirical research in law and economics? Right, so this um, leads to the question of um, how, how to integrate, uh, from, from one of the perspectives, is about how to integrate um, uh, the study of, of uh, the, the results of empirical research into thinking about the content of the law, which is typically what legal professionals uh, are, are interested in. Um, and in the article that I cited at um, uh, the beginning of my talk by, by Bob Cooter, um, he points out that, that, all, that in some circumstances, not, not, um, not always, of course, but in some circumstances, um, the uh, content of the law can depend in part on its consequences, um, or certainly how we, how we think about um, how, how uh, something should be interpreted might, might depend on its consequences. And uh, traditionally, legal professionals have relied on um, intuition or the general knowledge of human behavior to um, uh, draw those, those conclusions. And um, that, may often, uh, that may often be quite insightful, but we can think of empirical research as providing a, a set of systematic tool for um, studying human behavior. Um, and so on, on, certainly on average, uh, they're going to be far superior to the intuition of uh, legal professionals. And so perhaps that's one, uh, one way in which we might um, further the integration of the two. But uh, in, 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 of course, this varies with, with particular contexts. Um, uh, now, often legal professionals employ um, scientists or economists or others as, as uh, or use, use expert witnesses um, who provide uh, uh, who provide testimony or, or advice on, on specialized uh, on specialized issues. Um, another way to think about this is uh, to what extent should the legal professionals be able to uh, be in, informed consumers of this type of expert advice? Right? They obviously do not need to be able to replicate the um, the, um, uh, the work of an expert witness. Um, the, and indeed, you know, we, we, one of the basic economic concepts that you know, we, we should all be familiar with is the benefits of specialization and comparative advantage. But um, to be an informed consumer, I think one needs to understand something of the, of the conceptual foundations. Oh, Professor. Many thanks. I don't know if uh, I would give word to Maria Lucia just uh, to her final remarks and thanking again the audience for being present, inviting you to our next lecture on Thursday, 5 p.m. Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo local time and 4 p.m. Chicago time. Uh, it will be a pleasure to be here again. And thanks a lot again, Professor Demica. Uh, for all your interesting uh, topics and your interesting data today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, the University of Chicago. Please, Maria Lucia. 
Okay, just to say thank you so much, Professor Damika, for this valuable lecture. And I hope you we'll be together again this uh, Thursday. And thank you for all for the audience. Uh, we are very happy to have here. Thank you so much. <laughs>